welcome to the Pinnacle Health Auxiliary Annual Children's Health Fair okay. and the second Zoom presentation. Today, you will experience 13 different ways to stay healthy and stay. Some of them are healthy eating, exercising, what to expect if you need an x-ray or if you need to go to the hospital and be a patient. And you will learn reasons to why not to smoke, why not to be a bully, and why not to do drugs. So, welcome. Um, the UPMC Central Pennsylvania staff and volunteers have worked very hard to make today lots of fun and to quote one of my favorite cartoons from long ago, if you're not careful, you just might learn something before you die. Have a good day and welcome again to the um, Pinnacle Health Children's Health Fair. I'm sorry, Penny, I didn't introduce you. That wasn't on my thing. I one of the coordinators for the Children's Health Fair. Um, we do want to share a few reminders for everyone today. The event today is in webinar mode, which means you will not be able to turn on your cameras or your microphone. However, the chat is on. So if you have any questions for the station leaders, please enter them in the chat. Everything submitted will be sent directly to the host. Answers, um, if you do have any questions, answers will be sent after the event is over. Please know that for those who are attending the event with us live today, we will be recording the session and the recording will be shared with all participating schools no later than Monday, May 9th. Throughout the event today, we will be posting test questions. So if you are participating individually, we invite you to answer the questions in the Zoom poll. If you are participating as a class or watching the recording, there will be time in between each station to complete that learning station's questions. There will only be one or two questions per station, so take your time and try not to jump ahead. So now, without further ado, we want to welcome you to the 44th Annual Children's Health Fair, where you all will learn how healthy is happy. So we hope you enjoy. And so here's the first learning station, learning station number one, where we learn how healthy is eating nutritious foods. beneficial all these different food groups are for our body. So you may have heard about my plate. My plate is all about getting a variety of fruits and vegetables in, getting your lean protein in, getting some healthy whole grains in, and also some good low fat sources of dairy. So let's start with some vegetable ideas first. We want half your plate to be fruits and vegetables. Some great vegetable ideas are going to be broccoli, green beans, asparagus, squash, tomatoes, lettuce. There's so many great options out there. And we want you to try to eat the rainbow. Get a variety of colors. It's so healthy for you. We want you eating about two and a half cups of vegetables every single day. If you can get, cook them, you know, maybe you're having eggs for breakfast. Maybe have some veggies with this. Make a little omelet with your, with your eggs and throw some vegetables in there. Fruits. Fruits are also so excellent for us. They give us so many vitamins and minerals, lots of good fiber. So fruits that are going to be great for us are going to be your apples, bananas, oranges, melon, like watermelon, um, honeydew melon, even berries, blueberries, raspberries. They're all excellent for us. All fruit is so healthy for us and it tastes good too. Also very refreshing during the summer months. So get that fruit in. We want to try to have about two cups of fruit per day. So try to get that fruit in. It's a great snack as well. Another thing we want to be doing is whole grains. So whole grains, we want about a quarter of your plate to be whole grains or about the si this amount of rice 
You could have about two slices of whole grain bread, which would be great for you. Um, we want to try to get those whole grains in because they have a lot of good vitamins for us, like our B vitamins. They have iron, which helps to keep our blood strong, and also lots of great fiber, which helps with um, our digestive system. So we want to be getting all those good whole grains in. Whole grains are going to be your brown rice, whole wheat bread, whole wheat pasta, um, even things like quinoa. Have you heard of quinoa before? If you haven't, you might want to try it. Next thing that we want to make sure we're getting in is our protein foods. So protein is going to be things like your meats. So your chicken, turkey, fish, pork, um, even cheese and eggs, they are all packed full of protein. And we want to make sure you're getting that protein in. Protein helps to keep your muscles strong. It helps you to grow and it's just overall great for us. We do want to try to do lower fat sources of protein. So that's going to be your chicken breast, turkey breast, um, eggs are a great, great option as well. Um, if you're doing any steaks, try to choose a steak like a sirloin steak. It's going to just have some less fat in it, so that way we're getting more bang for our buck with that protein. So we want to make sure to be getting that in. To know how much protein is a good amount, about the size of the palm of your hand is a good portion for you. Typically at your age, you need about, um, about five and a half ounces of protein a day, which would be about two palms of your hand or two deck of cards if you're looking at a piece of meat. The next food group we wanna talk about is our dairy. So that's going to be our milk products. So dairy is what helps to give us calcium and keep our bones very, very strong. We need that, that dairy in our body. Foods that have this are going to be your milk, yogurt, and cheese. Preferably, we want to do a low-fat milk, which would be a skim or 1% milk. Um, yogurt is also great, and if you do Greek yogurt, you get much more protein with it. So try to choose a Greek yogurt option. That would be great for you. Cheese is also a good option. So for cheese, you could do cheddar cheese, you can do Swiss cheese, provolone cheese, they're all great options. So it's okay to have a little bit of cheese on your sandwich or with your dinner, go for it. And then overall, we wanna make sure you're drinking lots and lots of water. Water is the best thing for our bodies to be drinking. So make sure to be getting all those five food groups in, drink lots of water, and you should have a healthy, good diet. All right. Up next is our learning station number two, where we will learn how healthy is avoiding substances harmful to your body. Morning, everyone. My name is Heather, and I am the manager for the Center for Addiction Recovery. We are a doctor's office located in Harrisburg, and we help people who suffer from addiction. Um, having an addiction means that someone is doing something that is probably not good for their life, not good for their body, and they're having a hard time not doing that thing. Um, having an addiction does not mean that someone is a bad person. There are lots of good people who struggle with addiction. And so in our office, we help people who struggle with that. Uh, we also have a big purple bus that we take out and it's 
basically like a doctor's office on wheels so that we can go places other than Harrisburg to help people who are struggling with addiction. So it's something that can happen to anyone, anywhere, and we help people with that. Um, people can be addicted to lots of different things, but we specifically help people who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. Um, drugs is the word drug is something that can sometimes be used when people are talking about medicine. You might have heard people talk about going to the drug store, and that is not a store where people go get bad things. It's a place where people go to get medicine that can help them heal and help their body. Um, but drugs can also refer to something that people do and take that is really bad for their body. Um, sometimes, especially as you get older, you might see people doing drugs or drinking alcohol on TV shows or in movies, and they make it seem like something that is kind of fun to do, but actually doing drugs and alcohol is very, very dangerous. Um, even just doing something one time can be incredibly harmful to your body. It can make you very sick, and just doing it one time is enough for someone to become addicted to doing it. Um, so that's why it's really important for you to stay away from it and never even try it just one time to see what doing it is like. Um, sometimes, like I talked about, when people refer to drugs, they're talking about medicine. So your parents might give you something that's in a bottle like this or something that's a liquid that comes in something like this. And if you are getting it from a trusted adult, then taking medicine is definitely okay if a doctor tells you to, but you never wanna take something that someone says is safe unless it is from a trusted adult. Even if your friends say it's something that they have taken or done before, you definitely don't wanna do it unless it's coming from a parent or someone that you know would never do any harm to you. Um, so that's kind of why you know adults tell you not to take candy from strangers, because you never really know what might be in something and you don't want to do anything that's harmful to your body on accident either. And you never want to co um, take any of this stuff by yourself because it's really important that when you're taking medicine, you take the correct amount of it or otherwise it can be harmful to you then as well. Um, so even smoking things, um, taking, you know, swallowing pills that you might think is safe, drinking things, you never want to do something that a friend gives you. It's really important to only do it from trusted adults. Um, so really what it comes down to is just making healthy choices for your body, not putting anything in your body that isn't safe and healthy for you. And no matter what somebody else tells you, um, doing drugs and alcohol is just something that's really dangerous for you. So just make good choices and stay safe. Thank you. All right, up next is our learning station number three, where healthy is helping understand hospital tests. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cheryl, and I work in the imaging department here at UPMC. This is my friend, Ms. Gabones. And I don't know if you know this or not, but even though we all look like this on the outside, this is what we look like on the inside. We are all made up of bones. Now, Believe it or not, you're born with 300 bones, but by the time you become an adult like me, you have 206. So again, Mr. Bones right here, 206 bones in this body. What I want to talk to you about today is sometimes you break bones. Sometimes you fall down in the playground. Sometimes you're wrestling with your friends or your siblings and you fall down and break something. So your parents have to take you to the hospital. You might have to go to a doctor's office or an urgent care place. 
and they have to take a picture and that's called an x-ray. Now, I don't have a cell phone with me. I left it back there. But all of you know what cell phones are now. They have cameras in them. So very similar to what I'm going to talk to you about, if your parents or your friends hold a camera up and say, hey, I'm going to take your picture, probably one of the things they're going to tell you is to hold very, very still. Because what happens when you move all over the place? You're crazy when they're taking a picture. It's going to be blurry, right? It's not going to be the best picture. Well, the same thing for me. If I want to take your picture, first, I want to tell you that it's not going to hurt at all. Now, I realize if you break your bone, it's going to be painful. But let's say Mr. Bones here, he hurt his left arm, as you can see. But let's say Mr. Bones hurt his wrist, which is this area right here. You're going to come to see me. You're going to bring, come into a room with me. And I'm going to basically put your arm or your hand or whichever, again, body part you hurt. I'm going to lay it here on a flat surface. And I'm going to take a picture that takes less than a second. I'm going to ask you to hold very, very still. But otherwise, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to feel it. I'm going to take a picture. I might kind of turn your hand this way, take a picture this way, turn it this way. Sometimes take two or three, sometimes four different pictures. But no matter what I'm actually looking at under here, it's not going to be painful to you. So again, I'm going to say, hold still, take the picture. A doctor's going to look at the pictures and tell you if your bone is broken. So I have some cool pictures here to show you. I'm not going to sing for you, I promise. But I'm sure you all learned the song, Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes. I just want to show you some cool pictures. Again, this is Mr. Bone's skull right here. This is actually what a skull would look like on x-ray. So we take some really cool pictures with our x-rays. This is a shoulder. This is his shoulder area right here. And again, all these areas, all these are pictures of real people that hurt themselves and they needed to have these pictures taken. This is what a knee looks like on x-ray. Down here are his knees, okay? And toes, all the way down to his toes. So we can take lots of pictures of different body parts, checking out whatever bones that you may injure. And again, um, if you've ever gone to the dentist, one of the things that they may, might lay on you is something called a lead apron. And it's lead because we use something called radiation to take pictures. And the only area we want to have your body get radiation is what we're taking a picture of. So if you've ever gone to the dentist, this is what I use the most common example of, they lay that over you, and that's just protecting the rest of your body from the radiation. So they might put something like that over you. They might ask mom or dad or grandma or grandpa to step out of the room because, again, the only thing that needs to get radiation is the bone that you hurt. I want to show you one really cool thing and not ever to do. Here are some more pictures of x-rays. This one right here is the one that usually kind of is the most obviously something is very wrong. Somebody was using something called a nail gun and shot a nail through their finger. So you can imagine that probably really, really hurt. Okay. So again, these are just all some other cool pictures. So again, no matter what happens, you come in and again, you're going to find somebody very nice, very calm talking to you and saying, Hey, I want to take your picture. So if you can remember anything from today, it doesn't hurt. I want you to hold very, very still and the picture will get taken very, very quickly. So it's very easy. Hopefully you don't go out there and break any bones, but we are getting summer, it's a beautiful day outside. So if it happens, come see us, we'll take your picture and we'll get you squared away. Thank you. All right, up next is learning station number four, where healthy is helping others.
Hi, I'm Carla Finley. I'm Kirsten Schreiner. We're with Human Resources. Um, and we're just here with the recruitment team to um, tell you guys about our hiring process with UPMC and the day-to-day -day people that you guys see when you go to the doctor's offices or the hospital. Um, so what do you do when you're not feeling well um, or if you're visiting someone else who's not feeling well in the hospital um, or maybe even have been in an ambulance. I've actually been in an ambulance myself before. Um, so there's so many different people that you'll see there. Um, so we're going to take some time to talk to you today about a few. So when you're not feeling well or you're going to go visit someone who's not feeling well, you usually visit them at the hospital. You're greeted by the front desk person, a security officer who's there to keep us safe. And then you're also greeted by the medical staff that's working in the facility, um, care technicians or nurses who will take you to your room. Um, you're meted by the doctor who will discuss your medical care and discuss that with your parents as well. Um, so when you're taken back uh, to be seen or you're with someone who's going back to be seen, you may be taken back by a nurse, um, a patient care tech, um, a medical assistant, and there they'll take um, your vitals. So your blood pressure, your temperature, um, they might even listen to your heartbeat and have you breathe a couple times. Um, so once that happens, then the doctor will come in. Um, we hire all of the above, I guess, but... Um, um, some other people that you might see when you come to the hospitals or the doctor's offices will be our environmental services staff members who are our housekeeping personnel or our food service personnel because we have to have a cafeteria on site for our staff and patients. So we do hire those individuals as well. Um, everyone is there to make sure that our facilities are running great and smoothly just so we can give you guys the best care possible. Um, so going back to the ambulance, but um, if you've ever seen an ambulance in action, um, they can respond to car accidents, other emergencies along the way. Um, we also hire EMTs and paramedics. So that is who you'll see if you're ever in an ambulance. Um, so they are designed to take care of our patients after an accident has occurred, um, and they will get you to the hospital safely so that you can be seen and cared for. Um, some other things about our um, facilities and with the hiring process is we also have volunteers. So even if you're not like old enough to work, you can always come to the facilities and volunteer your time, help out, or older siblings. You might see some individuals that will deliver flowers to hospital, um, to the hospital rooms and all that. That's um, other organizations that we have in our facilities that HR will look under and assist as needed. Um, we hire everyone above. It's not just doctors and nurses here. There's needs for everyone in a hospital setting or medical office setting. Um, we have registration clerks as well. Those are the individuals that will take your mom and dad's con like contact information and insurance information to make sure that we're checking out the correct patient and all that fun stuff. Um. <laughs> um, so there are definitely careers that we did not touch on. Um, I know we can't hear you, but if you put any in the chat, if you know family members who work in a hospital or in urgent care, um, feel free to put them in there. There are a lot of careers at a hospital that you probably don't know about, um, but yeah. <laughs> also in our career. Yeah, in our <laughs> so career you can always work in HR to help hire those individuals as mm -hmm. well when you're older. So that's one thing that we um, have opportunities for here at our facilities. And we just hope that you guys do in the future come to healthcare. And you guys will probably be seeing us in the future so if you want to get hired. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Learning station number five is healthy is learning about your body. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gene. I'm a nurse here at UPMC Pinnacle. Today, we're going to talk about healthy is learning about your body. And specifically, we're going to talk about digestion. When we talk about digestion, I always ask the kids, where do you think digestion begins in your body? Most kids will say in your stomach. Well, that's not always true. Where it really starts is up here in your mouth. So to use my little guide that I have, I'm going to need a volunteer. We're going to ask Penny to come over and have a stand there. Penny will show you that the digestion does start in the mouth. So you'll see here that the digestion starting here, here's Penny chew, chew, chewing the food. There you go, keep chewing the food there. And he's chewing the food that will um, start the digestive process in our body. I'm sure you've all had breakfast this morning, I hope, and you'll be having lunch soon. The digestion starts here in the body with Penny chewing away. And then the food comes down this special food tube in our throat. Most people know that when you uh, breathe, you have a trachea that brings air into your lungs. However, the food tube, which is also called the esophagus, takes the food down into our stomach. And in the stomach, that is usually where a good bit of the digestion does take place. There are special folds in your stomach and in your intestine that grind the food up. They're called uh, chyme. And when they make it into chyme, the special folds are called rugae. And they grind that food up like, just like a masher, like a mixer in your house, grinding that food up real well, getting it into a nice thin liquid where it goes into the next part of the digestive system. Look at this here. This is all your digestive system inside your body. A lot of times I ask the kids, how do you think this is in our body? Look how long this is. And they go, well, it's all squished up in there. And you're right. It is squished up in there. It's basically compacted, folded upon itself here inside your body. And the food comes down through in our system into the body and it gets absorbed into our body. All the food that we eat and drink comes into our system and gets absorbed. Sometimes on the digestive system, we even have little problems that might wind up, in, wind up, wind us up in the hospital. And that one problem that we have here is this little bitty thing that sticks off of the um, digestive system on the intestinal tract. Some people may know the name of this, some people don't. I always use this as a quiz question for the kids that this part here, which is sort of down near the small intestine, large intestine, that little part, sometimes you come to the hospital, you got a bad pain in the right side of your belly, you might have a fever. You might have vomiting. Well, this little thing here may need to be taken out. And some people might even know neighbors, friends, relatives who've had this taken out in the past. Do you know what that's called, Penny? No, it's called the appendix. So sometimes you have to come to the hospital and have your digestive system worked on and have that appendix removed. Why do we need digestion, you would say? Penny, you would ask, why do you need digestion? You have to have food to fill your body up. That's true. What does digestion give us? That's right. You need digestion for energy when you're running and moving about. That's what the digestion is going to do for you. All that absorption of those special things that give us energy. What kind of things do you give us, give us energy, would you say, Penny? Is it the greasy stuff and the not so good stuff and the chips and pretzels? No, it's the good stuff that gives us energy and the nutrients that we need. The nutrients that we need so we can have the energy to continue with our day. So when you have breakfast and lunch, that's when you're getting all the energy you need from the nutrition that you gather in this digestive process. Look how long it is. It goes across the room if I had to go across the room. Me and Penny could be on either side of the room. And that just represents probably an average adult and what's inside their body. So Penny's might be a little bigger because he's a big guy. The digestion starts when we chew up here in our mouth and bring it down into our body, into our stomach through the esophagus. And again, digestion is the absorption of the nutrients that we need to make our bodies healthy, healthy and happy. Any questions, Penny? I guess I spoke too fast because we have a few seconds left probably. What do you like to eat? Do you like, um, well, you're a bear, so you probably like some nuts and vegetables, and nuts and fruits, I guess that's true, okay. And uh, me, I like to eat uh, a lot of pasta, unfortunately, yes. But I also like my veggies as well, especially in the summertime, because guess what's coming now? We're gonna start having a lot more squash on the grill, that's for sure. And I think we're gonna have a great time this summer. So kids, make sure lots of food, lots of um, energy to be gotten from your food and make sure you keep yourself well hydrated for your digestion. Thank you. Thanks, Penny. <laughs> Thank 
All right, up next is learning station number six, where healthy is finding help when you need it. Hi, I'm Heather. I'm the community paramedic here at UPMC. And um, we're gonna to talk today about emergencies. Does anybody know what number to call in case of an emergency? 911. When you do call them, um, you want to talk very, you want to talk quickly, but clearly and calmly so they can understand what the emergency is. Anybody know what an emergency is? What classifies as emergency? It's when your grandpa falls down and hurts himself, or you can't wake up your mommy or daddy, your grandparent. It's when you have a true emergency, not when just someone falls and hurts their knee. <laughs> when you call the dispatcher, they're gonna ask you some questions. And the first question they're gonna ask you is what is your emergency? And the best thing you can do is speak calmly when you're talking to them and tell them what the emergency is. They're gonna also wanna know what the address is of the emergency so they can send fire, police, or EMS to your place of residence where the emergency is happening. So if you don't know your address, the best thing to do is ask your caregiver what the address is, where they are, and put it on a card for you and put it by, the, um, by a calendar or on the refrigerator so that you always know where to look in case you have to call 911. The other question they'll ask is the phone number you're calling from. So that's important for them in case you get disconnected so they can call you back. That's why they need to know your phone number. And um, when the ambulance comes, you need to stay calm and act quickly, okay? They need to know exactly what's going on and where the patient is. And if you're yelling and screaming, they're not gonna be able to understand you. So when they, um, when they get in, when you get in the back of the ambulance, if it is you that they're coming for, there's a few things we do. We take your temperature. Um, if you are low on oxygen and you're having trouble breathing, sometimes we'll put some oxygen on you. And this just kind of tickles your nose, just fits right in your nose. And sometimes you need a little bit more oxygen. There's a little bit of a mask that we put on. It's not scary. It just smells a little, it's just air. And we also put um, a pulse ox on your finger. It goes right on your finger to measure the amount of oxygen in your blood and to tell us what your heart is doing, how fast or slow your heart is beating. We will also take your blood pressure. I'm sure some of you had your blood pressure taken before. Just gives your arm a nice hug, nice little squeeze. So, uh, being in an back of the ambulance should not be scary. We're not going to do anything scary to you. We just want to help you and your family member who's injured. So to recap, what number do we call when we have an emergency? We call 911. And how do we act when we call them? We call them, we act calmly and quickly when we need to talk to them so they can understand what our emergency is. So in, to wrap it up, just stay calm and be quick about your answers to the dispatcher and we'll take care of you. Thanks for your attention, everybody. Have a great day.
All right, up next is learning station number seven, where we will learn how healthy is protecting your hearing. Hi, I'm Lori Lyman. I'm an audiologist at Hearing Life in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. And we're gonna talk about the ear and how it can be damaged by noise exposure from things like loud music, shotgun blasts, farm equipment, things like that. So I'm gonna use some props to be like the ear. So the first thing I wanna show you is a, what's gonna be called the pinna. That's this part of the ear and that acts as a sound collector. Then you have your ear canal. This represents the ear canal. So you have the uh, sound is collected, goes down the ear canal, and then it goes to the eardrum. All of that is considered your outer ear. Your eardrum and behind is considered the middle ear. Right behind that eardrum are three small bones. These bones are the smallest bones in your ear and they vibrate the sound into the inner ear. The inner ear is the most important part. It's called the cochlea, that's the organ of hearing. And inside the cochlea are little nerve endings. And these little nerve endings are called cilia. And that's what can get damaged by noise exposure. And these little cilia actually look somewhat like these little things on here. So as the sound comes into your inner ear, there's fluid in there, water if you like, and it moves back and forth all the time to different sounds. And the cochlea is shaped like a snail and there's different frequencies. So you have sounds like sh, those are high pitched sounds. And you also have like a bass drum, that's a low pitched sound. And these high pitched sounds are what gets affected if you're around a lot of noise. So these little, ner these little hair cells, that's what they're called, they're hairs, they get beat it down every time you're in the noise. And sometimes they can't stand up anymore and they start to look like this. And this is what sends the information up to the brain. So if you have all of these mushed down, the information can't get sent up to your brain and you can have a hearing loss. It's also similar to when you walk across grass, if it's wet. When you walk on the wet grass, the grass goes down. And then after a while it comes back up and then it goes down. Every time you walk on it, it comes back up. And eventually, if you walk on it too much, it will stay down. It's the same thing with these. All that noise exposure can cause these little nerve endings to just come down like this. So it's very, very important whenever you're around background noise, such as uh, farm equipment, power tools, loud music, any of those things to make sure that you put earplugs in your ears. So again, Sound gets collected, goes through the ear canal, hits the eardrum, hits the three small bones, sends waves onto you here, and it goes up to your brain and you hear. All right, up next is learning station number eight, where we learn how healthy is breathing clean air.
Hello, everyone. My name is Pam, and I'm going to show you some lungs in a minute. But first of all, I want everyone to take a slow, deep breath on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. How does that feel? When we're able to take deep breaths like that and our lungs are healthy, they can get the oxygen and air to our bodies and our brains, and we can run and jump and play and think and learn and do all the things that we want to do. Now, I'm going to show you another set of lungs, or you're actually going to see a set of lungs here. And Adam's going to help me out here. So, the first lung is a pink lung. So these are actually pink lungs. And it's inflating, and you can see that it's working very well. And the color is pink, and this one is giving all the air and oxygen to your body. So now we're going to look, we're going to look at another lung. This lung is not pink. It's actually black. It's discolored from the tar in cigarettes. But I also want you to think about vaping and e-cigarettes and the harmful chemicals, including toxic metals and chemicals that cause cancer and lung disease. So when you look at this lung in the black color, it's not inflating well. It's not delivering the air and oxygen. And looking at the both lungs, what lung would you like to have for the rest of your life? Keep your lungs healthy and you can be as active as you want to be. All right. Up next is learning station number nine, where we learn how healthy is feeling secure in the hospital. Hi, everyone. My name is Monique. I'm a registered nurse in Perry Anesthesia. Perry, what might you ask? Big word, I know. Come join me and I'll tell you all about it. So my specialty is unique in that my department consists of three separate areas within the surgery world. First being pre-op. This is where I get the patient ready for surgery. Meet Mr. Bear. That includes having them get completely undressed to put on this fancy gown with these matching fancy slippers. These slippers are unique in that they have special grips on the bottom to prevent the patient from falling down. So we ask the patient a bunch of questions about their health and their history, and that is to make sure that we are giving them the best care possible throughout their stay. Once we have all of our information gathered, our prep is complete, and all questions are answered, we whisk them off to the OR in the stretcher, which is similar to a bed on wheels. And they basically say, not just goodbye, but see you later to their families. So Mr. Bear is all ready for, for the OR. Next, you'll meet my friend Rachel. You'll see that Rachel and I, even though we are both nurses, we have completely different roles um, working in the surgical world. 
Hi everyone, my name is Rachel. Um, Monique just mentioned me. I'm a registered nurse in the operating room and I'm gonna talk to you today about how my team and I work together to keep our patients safe. Not only do Monique and I work together very well, I her and her peri-anesthesia position and me in the operating room, but I have a bunch of people that I'm gonna talk to you about today that are also on my team back in the OR. So first I'm gonna tell you all about my outfit because I know you're all giggling from home about my funny hat. I come to the hospital in the morning and, and I actually change into my scrubs because these scrubs cannot be worn outside where the germs are. I also cover my hair and my shoes and my mouth and nose so that I don't spread germs. Now for today's purposes and because we're not in a real operating room, I'm not going to have a mask on. But normally going into an operating room, I would have a mask on and make sure that my nose and mouth are covered. So now I'm going to tell you about my team back in the operating room. Um, it's of course the doctor who does the surgery and a doctor who puts the patient to sleep. He's called an anesthesiologist, another big word. A surgical technologist and then myself, the nurse. Every person on my team has a very important role in the operating room to keep this patient safe. The doctor is the one who's going to do the surgery and he has all the knowledge to perform the surgery safely. The anesthesiologist is going to put the patient to sleep, our teddy bear is our patient today, and make sure that they are breathing the whole time that they are sleeping. They monitor this with fancy machines and they're constantly up there looking at those machines during the surgery. The surgical technologist is in charge of everything that's sterile in the room. We have a sterile field and here everything is blue, so we say if it's blue don't touch it. I'm going to show you some things that the surgical technologist works with, so I am going to touch this for this instance. But they um, have to wear a sterile gown and a sterile pair of gloves when they're working with this stuff back here on the table. Um, when the surgeon comes in and he helps with the operation, he will also put on a sterile gown and sterile gloves. And the um, surgical technologist will dress him for that. The scrub knows and understands the purpose of every instrument on this back table. They set up and organize this table and they're in charge of handling the instruments and handing them off to the surgeon when he asks for one. The surgical technologist knows the name of all the instruments. For example, what do you think this instrument looks like? Did you say a scissor? Because if you did, you're right, it is a scissor. But let's look closely at the back table at all of the different types of scissors that we have. They all look different and all are used for a different purpose. Now we're going to move to my role as a nurse in the OR. I help assist wherever it is needed. I help to position the patient so that the doctor has access to the surgery site and I also prep the patient's surgery site with a solution that kills the germs. This cleans better than soap. I also have to count all of the instruments, sharps, and sponges that the surgical technologist has on their table. We count these instruments, sharps, and sponges multiple times throughout the procedure to make sure we know where everything is and so that is not left in a patient. During the procedure, I open supplies that they need and do the charting on the computer. Hi again, it's Monique here. So next stop is the PACU. This is known as the Post Anesthesia Care Unit. Long fancy word again, but PACU for short. So patients here are really sleepy after their visit to the OR because of the medications they receive during surgery. As they arrive to us asleep, our job as the PACU nurse is to watch them closely until they awaken from pleasant dreams. During their time here with us, we provide them with warm blankets, some oxygen, and a quiet place to wake peacefully to. So this job is so much fun. Every day is different. Uh, every person is different. There's different surgeries and different patients that I get to meet. I'm never bored, but I want to thank you for coming today and spending time to learn about the surgical world.
All right, up next is learning station number 10, where we learn how healthy is a cavity free smile. Welcome to my station about dental health. My station's topic is healthy is a cavity free smile. My name is Mrs. Butera and I'm the dental hygienist for Harrisburg School District. So having a cavity free smile is more than just brushing your teeth two or three times a day and flossing in between. Those are very good habits to have, but today you'll learn more information about how to keep plaque germs, also known as sugar bugs, away. So first, let's talk about the structure of a, teeth, of a tooth. There are three layers of a tooth. The enamel, which is on the outer side, the part that you see in the mirror when you smile, the center part, which is the dentin, it's a little bit softer, and on the center is the pulp. It's the nerve center of your tooth that tells you your tooth is alive. And you can tell this because sometimes your tooth gets a little shiver when you bite into something cold. Next, let's talk about plaque. Plaque is the icky, sticky, ooey gooey coating of germs that you notice most when you wake up in the morning because it might give you some bad breath. The fact about plaque is that plaque germs love sugar. In fact, they need them to make them strong. The bad thing is when they get strong, they might cause a cavity, which is a hole in the layers of your teeth. Sometimes you get a toothache if that hole gets too close to the center nerve center of your tooth. So we get rid of plaque germs by brushing and flossing your teeth, your gums, and your tongue. Plaque germs can hide everywhere in your mouth. So imagine playing hide and seek with the plaque germs when you brush. If you were a plaque germ, would you hide in the front or the back? That's right, in the back. So do a better job of brushing your molars in the back to get rid of those sticky germs. So next we're gonna talk about sugar. Everybody likes sweet stuff, especially now and then. And sugar can be in foods that we eat. Candy, cookies, sodas. Those are all things we should have just once in a while. But unfortunately, all foods can have some amount of sugar in them. So today we're going to talk about sodas because when you take a drink of soda, it coats your tooth with sugar. The most common way that we get sugar on our teeth is by the drinks that we drink and the sugar turns to acid from the plaque on your teeth with every sip. Did you know that each can of soda has about 140 calories and 39 grams of sugar? When you think of grams of sugar, it might be confusing because we don't usually use grams, we use teaspoons. So I have a little math problem because I know you guys are good at math to figure out grams and teaspoons. So if there's 39 grams of sugar, you're going to divide by four and you come up with almost nine and a half teaspoons of sugar. That's a lot of sugar. If you drink two sodas a day or you have a refill, that could be almost 20 grams of sugar. So if you have that every day for a month, it's a five pound bag of sugar that you've consumed. That's a lot of sugar. And it takes 100 miles of walking to get rid of the excess calories that come from this non-nutritive drink. If you don't burn it, burn it off, you store it as fat. Here is two and a half pounds of fat, and that's how much you would store just by two drinks a day alone. Kind of frightening, right? And I measured it out into a bag so you can see what that sugar looks like. This is 18 and a half teaspoons coming from two cans of soda. That's a lot of sugar. Water is best if you're thirsty because water has zero sugar and it does not harm your teeth in any way. So healthy habits for your teeth are to brush your teeth and floss every day. And I have my friend here, Allie the alligator with me to show you the best way to brush your teeth. There's three sides of your teeth, the front side, the back side, and the flat side. So you should brush your teeth every day on those three sides. Putting your teeth together, little circles are best because plaque germs do not like to be tickled. That's the front side, side number one. Side number two is the back side along the inside part of your teeth. Number three is the flat side. 
So now you've just brushed all three places that plaque germs can hide, the front side, the back side, and the flat side. Your bonus place is your tongue, so that way you won't have bad breath. The second healthy habit is to visit your dentist twice a year for a checkup and to think about your drink. Choose water most often so you have less sugar attacks on your teeth with the sugar bugs. So there you have it. Brush your teeth, visit the dentist, and think about your drink. Question of the day is too many sugary drinks can cause a, you guessed it, a cavity. So the more you brush and the more you think you drink, the less chance of cavities you'll have. Thank you for visiting my station. Have a great day. All right, next up is learning station number 11, where we'll learn how healthy is staying safe on the internet. Hey kids, it's your old pal McGruff the crime dog here. Meet my friend Faux Paw the techno cat. Faux Paul and I want to help you learn to be safe when you're on the internet. You want to know more? Here's our story. Good night, Faux Paul. Some of it is safe and helpful, and other places are bad and dangerous. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. Oh. Hey, Papa, are you ready for some fun? Then try the ball of yarn chat room. <laughs> I have a bad feeling about this. I adore yarn. Hey, let's get together, and I'll share my yarn with you. Jumping junipers. Never agree to me with anyone you've connected with online. Sir, sir, you are in the way. When can we meet? I know just the place. Never give your name, address, or phone number to anyone online. Meet me at the light post in front of the state capitol. Can't go! Popo! Popo! Wait! Wait! No! Hello, Popo! I'm happy! Wolfie! 
Chitty. Chitty face. <laughs> Jumping junipers. Quick, full pop, get in. <laughs> Lucky tonight, faux pas. You've got an internet pal who's looking after you. Remember, keep safe. Keep away. Keep telling. I keep safe. I keep safe my personal information. All of it. I never give my real name, address, phone number, the name of my school, or a picture of myself to anyone online. I keep away from internet strangers, no matter what they tell me, because I have no way of knowing who they really are. I keep telling my parents about everything I see on the internet. I always tell them, or a trusted adult, when something makes me feel uncomfortable. Help us take a bite out of crime. Up next is learning station number 12, where we will learn how healthy is getting your body moving and your blood pumping. Hello, third graders. My name is Miss Kate. I'm a nurse and a health coach with UPMC Pinnacle, and I'm here to talk to you about your heart. Now, the job for your heart is to pump blood all the way through your body from the top of your head to the bottom of your big toe. So it's really, really important to keep your heart as healthy as possible. Everybody make a fist like this. Now put it out in front of you. Oops, Miss Kate. <laughs> that is about how big your heart is. Now put it right here in the center of your chest. You feel those hard bones, that's your rib cage. They're there to protect your heart. Your heart lies right underneath. So your ribs, if you're biking or on your scooter or your skateboard or playing sports and you fall, the rib cage protects your heart. Now, your heart is a muscle, but unlike the muscles in your arms or your legs that you can exercise by using weights, your heart needs you to exercise so that it builds itself into the strongest muscle possible. So the way we do that is to get off of this muscle, your gluteus maximus, give these muscles a little bit of a break from playing those video games and really start to move. You should try to move for at least 60 minutes. That's one hour every day. And that can be riding your bike. That can be playing sports. That can be jumping rope. That can be simply running and walking and skipping and having a good time outside. But for today, what we're going to do is we're gonna get that heart pumping a little bit so you can see the great work that it does. Now, take these two fingers. Put them right in the center of your neck and then skirt them over a little bit right there and press. You should be able to feel 
home, your heart beating. It's a little tricky. You may need to get a grown-up to help you. You can also find your pulse, that's another word for your heart beating, on your wrist. But anyhow, we're going to get that heart pumping so you can see what you need to do to take good care of your heart. Now, everybody stand up and get ready. Miss Kate is a lot older than you. You can tell by the color of her hair, but I'm going to challenge you to keep up with me. Okay, we'll start slow and then we'll go fast. Are you ready? Make sure there's nobody around you so you don't hurt them or yourself. Touch your toes, touch your knees, touch your shoulders and jump. Touch your toes, knees, shoulders, jump. Toes, knees, shoulders, jump. Go in. Jump. 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 Are you getting tired yet? I hope not. Keep going. How about a little bit faster? Really get that heart pumping. See how high you can jump. Okay, now take those same fingers. Find that pulse. It should be pumping harder and faster. And that's because you're giving your heart the workout it needs to stay healthy and strong. Work that heart muscle. Another way you can take care of your heart is by eating the right kinds of foods. Things like burritos, soda pop, cupcakes, pies. They're treats, so you should only eat those occasionally. You want to make sure you're getting fruit, vegetables, and meat, chicken, and pork, and tuna fish, and all those good things to help make your heart as healthy as it can be. So third graders, that's how to keep your heart healthy. Get outside when you can. If it's rainy, dance inside your house and make your heart as healthy and strong as can be. Bye now. All right, and last but not least, our, very, our final learning station is learning station number 13, where we learn how healthy is having a mindful body. Hi, my name is Marianne Sutton and I'm a psychologist with the UPMC Psychological Associates. So I'm here to talk to you guys today about mindfulness, but first we're going to talk about what is not mindfulness. So sometimes our bodies and minds are very busy and we can be pretty distracted. So for example, you could be sitting in class and thinking less about what your teacher is saying and maybe paying more attention to what am I going to have for lunch today? Uh, what are my friends doing or what's going on outside the window? That is not mindfulness. That's when we're distracted. But so mindfulness is a practice of paying attention in the present moment to help our bodies and minds feel calm, focused, and attentive. So we're gonna practice an activity today that should be fun, but also to help you to stay calm and focused. And we're gonna use all of your senses today. So I hope that you guys have fun with it, all right? So you just wanna stay seated in your seat um, in a relaxed position. 
And I'm going to tell you some things to, to find and do with each of your five senses. So first, we're going to find with our eyes five things that we can see around us right now. So pick out five things. Great job. Now, next, we're going to acknowledge four things that we can touch. And don't leave your seat, um, but you can touch things. You might notice your, your desk, your chair you can touch, um, but just find four things right now that you can touch. Okay. Next, we are going to use our ears and think about three things that we can hear in this moment. So you have to be very quiet and listen for three things that you can hear right now. Okay. Next, we're gonna use our noses, and I want you to pay attention to two things that you can smell right now. So it could be like your, your laundry detergent on your clothes or your hair, but just find two things that you can smell. And then finally, we are going to think of one thing that we can taste. And you might not be eating anything right now, but so you can even imagine something like tasting a mint, or you might still taste something like your toothpaste or something that you recently ate or drank. So find one thing uh, that you can taste right now. Now I want you just to notice how your body feels after using those five senses. So do you notice that your body feels calmer um, and more focused and in the present moment? Now, the cool thing about mindfulness is you don't need any special equipment to practice. You can practice anywhere you're at and you can do something like the five, four, three, two, one that we just tried anywhere you are and at any time. So it's, it's very easy to do. And the more we practice it, the better we get. And then my final tip for mindfulness is it's something we get better with with time. And so give yourself that time and practice. And if you notice that your mind is wandering, we can think of our minds like a puppy that likes to wander and explore the world. Sometimes our minds do that, but we just want to gently bring our minds back to the present moment. So thanks very much. And I hope that you guys practice some mindfulness today. Okay. All right, so we hope you enjoyed your time with us as you learned how healthy is happy. We want to thank our sponsors, UPMC um, Pinnacle Foundation, the Pinnacle Health Auxiliary, the Community Health Initiatives Team, and all of our volunteers who helped make this day a success. We hope you enjoy your goodie bags, and we hope to see your school again next year. Bye!